Okay, so welcome everybody. This is a 100 Granny sponsored event and we have Dr. Mary Skopek who started working for the Iowa DNR Ge Geological Survey in 1991. And since then, she has been involved in several agency-wide projects with impacts on water quality. Dr. Skopek coordinated a statewide pesticide database to track pesticide occurrences in Iowa's water resources. In January of 2000, she started working for the Watershed Monitoring and Assessment Section. Among other things for the section, she currently coordinates and analyzes data from the statewide Ambient Water Monitoring Program. She also serves as the Iowa Water, that's one word, one word, Iowa Water Volunteer Monitoring Program Coordinator. Mary earned her BS and MA degrees in geography from the University of Iowa, and in 1999, she completed her PhD in environmental science. So she's going to tell us tonight what we all need to do to improve Iowa's water. children, so I usually speak loudly, so I won't blow you out of the water with my loud voice. Um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about water quality, give you a background of water quality issues, a slice of water quality issues, and then talk about things that maybe you could do to get involved in water quality in the state of Iowa. Uh, hopefully this is a discussion, so if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt. If I use terminology or something that you're not tracking, uh, feel free to ask me a question to clarify. When we talk about water quality, I think oftentimes people assume toxic things in the water, and they're thinking about drinking water, they're thinking about those toxic, nasty chemicals that they've read or heard about. And really, when we talk about water quality as scientists, as, as water quality professionals, it's a lot more than that. It's things like how much water is in the stream, how fast is that water moving in the stream, how fast that water rises in that stream and drops as well as things like what kind of fish and uh, benthic macrovertebrates or critters that the fish eat are in the stream, what kind of algae is in the stream, how much water temperature is out there, is it, is it getting too hot too fast or is it staying too cold, uh, as well as things like sediment and nutrients that we'll talk a lot about today, habitat and all these other things. And so when you talk about water quality, it's a very broad topic. And again, I'm going to give you a little slice of that. Uh, it's hard to be exhaustive with all the different things that are going on in the state, but I'll try and give you my perspective of what I think are the most important issues facing us right now in Iowa. To do that, I usually like to start with this slide, which is to talk about understanding water quality issues in terms of the drivers as opposed to uh, the outcomes. I think oftentimes when we start hearing about water quality in the news, we're talking about the outcomes. We're talking about in, in my analogy, we're talking about the symptoms as opposed to the disease. So we really want to focus on how do we address the disease or the driver of that water quality problem to, to get a better water quality situation for the state, recognizing that those outcomes are just a symptom of what's, what's happening out there. And that to get solutions to those issues, we really need to think about those root causes and address those root causes. So I'd like to spend just a little bit of time talking about what I see are those root causes or those drivers for water quality issues in the state of Iowa. Perhaps the most important thing for water quality issues in Iowa has been that we have completely replumbed and, and modified our hydrology. And this is a slide that I've borrowed and used many, many times from Connie Mutel, who I think was out at uh, Prairie Preview last week. And I love her dearly and she's got these great slides. And really, and I love her description about how Iowa used to look. And if you think about the prairie landscape, that when rain would fall, say 300 years ago, the first thing that rain droplet would hit is some sort of vegetation or some sort of um, organic matter. And that that organic matter would slow the velocity of that rain, and that rain would slowly dribble to the ground where it could soak into that prairie soil. And it was a very slow, groundwater-driven hydrology. When you think about Iowa 300 years ago, you think slow, <laughs> very slow hydrology. And if you look at this map, this is a map, the blue is what we would call a hydric soil, which essentially just means that that soil formed under very wet conditions. 
And so Iowa had a lot of hydric soil. It was a wet environment, and that wet environment was uh, not terribly conducive to agriculture at the time. But you look at Iowa, we know about the wetlands in sort of that north central part of the state, but in fact, much of Iowa had that very hydric wet soil phenomenon as <coughs> well. And so that was an important sort of thing that we had going on in the state. And then we modified that pretty dramatically. I think the number one modifier when we talk about the state of Iowa is something called tile drainage. And if you're not aware of what tile drainage looks like, again, stealing from Connie liberally here, um, tile drainage basically works like this diagram here, where the water table, where the water in the ground 300 years ago would have been sitting essentially at the surface. That wasn't good for crops because you couldn't have roots in saturated wet soils. There was not enough air, enough oxygen in that root zone for those plants to grow. So for that to happen, you had to draw that water down so that you had air in the soil. And to do that, we ended up putting in these things called agricultural tiles. Um, those tiles, the name really comes from the fact that those early, early tiles were clay pipes or clay tiles and were much, um, oftentimes, hand dug and placed in the ground. And again, that's water being pulled from the surface, pulled from that, that zone, moved to a lateral pipe and then to a ditch that was most often constructed on the landscape. Much of that uh, central part of the Iowa landscape here didn't really have much in the way of defined streams. That water sat there, it didn't move very quickly to a stream, and so we had to ditch the area and we had to provide that tile. So here's a, a picture from 1911 of a mechanized ditching machine that's then connecting those agricultural tiles. And then here's what a modern tile looks like. Now there are PVC pipe coming out into the stream. The reason that's important is there's about three things that that tiling did. Come on up. You get to know me really well. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a quiet person. So the couple things that that tiling did is it drew that water table down. And by drawing the water table down and adding air to that soil zone, that changes the chemistry of the soil, it changed the chemistry of that environment. And for your uh, reference, the most important thing is that it provided um, a mechanism for nitrates to start forming in that soil taking that organic form of nitrogen that blocked in all those prairie roots, all that vegetation that was really locked away, and you add that oxygen and you start to get decay and you start to get mineralization of that soil to nitrate. So now we've got an environment where nitrate is forming, even without fertil fertilizers happening. And then we've created a connected system that the landscape used to not be very connected to a stream. And there are models that say it may have taken hundreds of years for a drop of rain in parts of Iowa to get to a stream. Current models say that that's at the most about five to seven days for any drop of rain to get to a stream. So from centuries to days for that water to get there, we've connected every piece of that landscape. And we've increased the stream power. Because the faster water gets to that stream, the more power it has. Powerful streams are hungry. They erode, they carry things. And so by completely modifying our landscape hydrologically, we've created an environment where contaminants and things move very rapidly into our system. To really drive that home for you, this is a, a really phenomenal map. Um, many of those tiles, especially <coughs> private tiles, were not mapped. There's no record keeping really of those private tiles. Uh, in contrast, um, these green lines here, these are uh, drained district tiles. So they were recorded, we have some idea of that. Uh, I think there's something like 60 chapters of Iowa code that deal with drainage law, so it's a very complicated part of Iowa's history. But this is a map that was taken, essentially a picture taken from the sky of Iowa after a rainstorm. And if you give Iowa a couple of days to drain, what you see is that where the water is being pulled out of the landscape, being pulled out of the soil, you start to see these white lines. White indicates that something's drier. The darker areas indicate that things are wetter. So you can see where we've got some pretty dark wet spots as well as these really nice linear features. So even though these weren't mapped tile lines, by having this photography taken a couple days after a rainstorm, you can really see those linear features. And so somebody who does mapping for a living can go in and actually start to draw those lines. 
In this case, this is Hamilton County, North Central Iowa. This is a two square mile area. In two square miles, there are about 56 miles of drainage tile. So again, where things, water used to fall here and it would not be connected to a stream, you're hard pressed to see where something couldn't get to a stream pretty easily now in the state of Iowa. And I think that Andy was even, Andy Sell was the one who did this uh, map for us. I think he was even pretty conservative because there's still some linear features you can see here that he did not map. Estimates, when we did um, uh, a book about 10 years ago on Iowa, Portrait of a Land, we estimated about a million miles of drainage tile in the state of Iowa. And I think that's a very conservative estimate for the amount of drainage tile in the state of Iowa. And people have likened it to the building of the Panama Canal, where you take an entire state and completely replumb it, uh, that that's a massive undertaking. And I think it's hard to underscore what this did to our hydrology and how it changed our complete uh, system in the state of Iowa. So what does that do? We, like I said, we've changed that hydrology. Well, that changed everything. And I talked about that stream power, that, that water that's moving to the stream now, it's hungry. And what you see, this is a, from a thesis that was done about 15 years ago. And again, Hamilton County, so that was the county I was showing you that had intensive tiling. Hamilton and Story County. And from the early surveyor's notes, this is what the watershed or the area that would have drained to this little low spot or just there's a little bit of a defined stream. But this is what the watershed looked like in 1847, we think. And you can see that there's a little bit of a stream, but it's mostly very disconnected. By 1919, we now have stream all the way to the headwater of this watershed. And by 1972, we've started to add even more drainage network. And what that means is, again, anything being applied to this landscape is moving to that stream in a much more effective way. So now we've connected and, cre and created a situation where things are moving off that landscape. In addition to the fact that we've tiled the landscape, we've also crowded our streams. And so this is the, the East Nishnabotna River and a tributary coming in. And you can see that we essentially have no floodplain vegetation. We have very little floodplain function left. We have all of our practices really just nestled right up on that stream. There's nothing that's shading the stream. There's nothing that's providing organic matter to the stream. And that's important because when you look at something called the river continuum concept, which is kind of a a fancy way of saying that the headwater streams are connected to the lower streams. And they're connected in a couple of different ways. One is that we have energy that should be cascading through that system. And we should have uh, organic matter. So usually the headwater streams, they tend to be streams that have a lot of vegetation over them, either grasses or trees, providing or that organic matter to the stream. And then all the little bugs that eat organic matter are going crazy. They love that. They love eating that, that detritus, that uh, vegetation. But if you don't have that, those bugs can't be there because there's nothing for them to eat, which means further downstream, the bigger bugs and the fish don't have the things that should be washing down toward them. And so the entire system becomes disrupted because your headwaters don't have what they need. Your lower streams don't have what they need either. So streams like the Iowa River just simply don't have the, the uh, energy and uh, organism cascades that they should have, and it really disrupts that entire uh, ecosystem. The other thing that happens is that we get processing function. And what I mean by that is if you think about um, contaminants like nitrogen that end up in that stream, if that stream is healthy, there's some ability for that stream to process that nitrogen, to take it up, to put it into new vegetation, to essentially incorporate that nutrient. When that function is missing, it just becomes basically a pipe that shoots those contaminants downstream. Um, Iowa used to have one of the richest populations, there's a picture of mussels here, those freshwater clams or mussels. Iowa had one of the richest populations in the world of those freshwater mussels. And they're filter feeders. And they were doing an amazing job of filtering contaminants out of our streams. By losing 95 to 99% of those organisms, we no longer have that filter function. And so we've disrupted that ecosystem that used to be there. Those organisms, those mussels, are, are under attack under a number of ways uh, that we probably don't have time to get into today. Um, we want to talk about that later today. But the fact that we've disrupted the ecosystem 
means that we have some big problems for our lower streams. Okay, so driver number two is again, not surprising to anybody here, but the massive land use alterations that have happened in the state. So the top map again is a survey, surveyor estimate of what I will look like. The yellowy kind of brown colors were prairie, uh, intermixed with that, you have sort of a purple color, which was wetlands, um, trees that were pretty confined to the, the big river valleys, um, southern Iowa. Uh, and if you look at, this is an old map, this is 1990s, so this is probably more grassland than what we have today. But you can see all the gray is now row cropped area. We've lost all that prairie function, we've lost those wetlands. Our trees have very much been receded back from along those big river valleys. So again, we have this massive land use alteration, which again, everything that we do to those landscapes in terms of applying pesticides, applying nutrients, have now become more and more um, dominant on our landscape. And so one of the things, one of the big arguments, and I'm just gonna hit it head on and just be done with it. When we talk about nitrogen, for example, and that urban lawns are a problem for nitrogen, look at the map, <laughs> right? We have less than a percent of urban lawn in the state of Iowa. And every monitoring shred of data I've ever collected, urban lawns are not an issue for nitrogen. In fact, we see decreases of nitrogen when we move through urban areas. A, the lawn uses that nitrogen more effectively. It's, your lawn is probably growing right now, today, right? So urban lawns use those nutrients. Um, not to say that you shouldn't be careful of how much you use. We should always be you know, uh, prudent in what we use. But we do not have enough urban lawn to make a hill of difference in, in Iowa. There's just not enough of area, um, even if they were producing very much nitrogen, which they're not. All right, the last, I think this is my last driver, is of course with the 100 grannies, not the 100 grannies, the 100 grannies, is to talk about climate change. And it's a very real phenomenon. I've been using these slides for a long time. And I used to put a question mark, and I've sort of removed that question mark in my mind, that climate change is here, we're seeing those rainstorm events, we're seeing that, that pattern in our precipitation. And early estimates were that you know, the upper Midwest would increase the amount of precipitation by 31%. So when we have hydrologic modification that moves water more quickly to the streams and more water, we've got a recipe for some issues happening in our state. And this is a, a picture from the Iowa MesoNet, which basically takes all the rainfall data and creates these gorgeous maps. And so this is a map for 48 hours of precipitation last summer. And hopefully you can see these bands that are sort of the peachy, pinky colors, we're talking six to nine inches of rain in those colors in 48 hours. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I don't think I ever heard of a nine inch rainstorm that one to two inches were our big rainstorms. And we, our statistics tell us that the majority of rain should be less than an inch and a half. And we're getting these massive rainstorm events that sit over the state and create all kinds of problems for us. Um, the other thing that's a problem is they oftentimes align with the direction of our river basins. And so we had tremendous flooding along here because that nine inches of rain fell in line with that river basin and again, all the things that are occurring on the landscape are washing quite effectively into the stream. So how do these things impact our resources? So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the outcomes and get away from the drivers just to kind of reinforce uh, the issues that we have. Uh, of course, we're seeing major flooding and I put this picture montage up here because we've had major floods in 08, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, right? So we're no longer talking about floods that are occurring every couple of decades. Now it's about an every year thing. And these are big floods, and they didn't all impact us here in, in Eastern Iowa or Iowa City, but they are big events, and they have destructive abilities throughout the state. And if nothing else, this should open eyes that we've got some severe issues to deal with. Um, and then of course we throw a drought in there every once in a while, so then we have the biggest drought since the Dust Bowl in 2012 followed by one of the big floods. And again, that's not good from a water quality standpoint. I'll talk about that in just a second. So what does that mean in terms of when we start to see bigger and bigger rainstorm events? The point of this fancy graph is to talk about, if you take the rain and look at what percentage of rain that falls ending up in a stream. 
Our estimates from 300 years ago that about 5 to 10 percent of the rain that fell would end up in a stream, which is not a very big percentage. If you take a look at, this is the Cedar River at Cedar Rapids, the watershed coefficient is just a way of expressing that percent. So 0.2 would be 20 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent. And what you can see is, as kind of a long-term average, running average, that's trending upward. A higher and higher percent of the water ending up in the stream. And if you take a look at it, you know, we've gone from about maybe 20%, really running up toward 50% on the Cedar River, which is a huge river, 7,000, 8,000 square miles. When we focused in on the basic two weeks of the 2008 flood, about 65% of the rain that fell in that two-week period ended up in the stream. It's a huge hydrologic traffic jam. Hmm. And so again, the water has nowhere to go. It's carrying all kinds of nasty things. And we really need to figure out what, to, uh, what we're going to do here. This is a long-term upward trend that is not sustainable for our state. All right. Um, what else is going on? Well, we see tremendous things like this, where we lose huge swaths of bank. Um, we have estimates in some cases where 50% of the sediment or dirt in the stream is coming from the banks. I've got pictures. Um, well, Old Man's, Old Man's Creek in 2013 lost about 100 feet of bank in one event. Um, huge amounts of sediment. Uh, the Raccoon River, uh, we're seeing progression of the Raccoon River towards drinking water wells that the city of Des Moines has. And so when we start to lose these big hunks of, of land, again, what does that mean for the water resource? Well, it looks dirty, so this is not pleasant looking water. And again, it goes back to the fact that we have no buffer here along this stream. So more water, no buffer, no protection for that stream and our water quality. What else does that mean? Well, <laughs> the number one issue right now in my life and in the state is nitrate. And again, these are uh, median, so sort of what your 50th percentile of, of nitrate levels are in the state of Iowa. The drinking water standard is 10, which is based on the blue baby syndrome, which is too high probably for human health. There's a lot of human health studies to suggest that three to four is more appropriate for cancer risk. So if we take a look at the dots around the state, we have very few sites that are really uh, below five where we would want to be for drinking water. And they tend to be in southern Iowa. There's less tiling down here in southern Iowa. So where we have tiling, we have huge amounts of nitrate. And that's why we have a situation right now with the Des Moines Water Works saying, we cannot produce drinking water that's safe for citizens of Des Moines. And you can see these are median values. So 50% of the values are above these numbers. And we're seeing above 8 to 13, 50% of the values. Not sustainable long-term for drinking water, as well as for aquatic life. If we look at phosphorus, our goal for phosphorus would be basically anything, well, 0.1 uh, milligrams per liter parts per million. So the green is kind of getting there. Anything that's not green is way too high. And phosphorus is the, the nutrient that drives that green water. And it very quickly goes from being sort of scuzzy looking water to intensely green. When we start getting up here to 0.6, we have tremendous algae blooms that are not good for human health as, as well as aquatic health. We get things that look like this. So this is a, a, this is a sample. You can see the lake behind it. Um, this is what we call blue-green algae bloom. It doesn't look terribly blue, but these are organisms that have been around for a long, long time. Blue-green algae have been, um, or were one of the first organisms on Earth. They've got this adaptation where they can produce toxins. The toxins they produce are liver toxins, neurotoxins, skin toxins. Um, what we're seeing is that these toxins are starting to happen much more frequently. So these. These algae have been around, these blue-green bacteria have been around for a long time. Some of them have a gene that allows them the, to produce the toxin, which we think is an adaptation to outcompete other things. The problem is it also is a toxin that kills things. And dogs are especially sensitive to the toxin, um, but humans are as well. And so we are becoming more and more concerned about the level of these toxins in our water. Above 20 is where we would put an advisory for swimming. And you can see over about 10 years of monitoring, we've had a number of lakes that have had a number of advisories about being over 20. 
in 2013, I think it was, 2014, Toledo, Ohio had a problem because Lake Erie had such a massive bloom. The top, one of the toxins was so high that they couldn't use Lake Erie for drinking water anymore. And the levels were of concern enough that EPA fast-tracked health advisory levels for drinking water. And those of us who work with EPA know that EPA never fast-tracks anything, <laughs> and they never fast-track anything in months, which is what they did with these health advisory levels. The drinking water health advisory level for children is 0.3 micrograms per liter. This is above 20, right? Many of these lakes serve as drinking water sources for many of our, our cities out there. And last year, we were monitoring about five different communities to look at the raw water coming into the drinking water and what was coming out of finished water. We're gonna be looking at a much more aggressive program this year to look at these toxins in drinking water because they're toxins and we're concerned about it. These are a climate change indicator. They love warm water. Um, this year, I'm quite concerned because we have temperatures that are already warm and we've got a lot of nutrients moving into our streams. They love nutrients, they love warm water. Iowa has the perfect recipe to have more and more toxic algae occurring. So this is a, quite concerning for us to look at the trajectory. And if you look at the number of advisories, again, we're on this upward mark with the number of advisories we've seen in the state of Iowa. We also have things like fish kills occurring in the state of Iowa because of all the stuff that's washing off the landscape. Um, if you take a look at this pie chart, it may be a little bit difficult for you to see. About 29% of them we call natural or environmental. And I would say that's sort of a euphemism for um, the water is stressed enough that the fish, if we have low levels of oxygen because the water already looks green like you saw in that previous picture, any additional insult, temperature goes a little bit high, gets stagnant, we get a fish kill. We call that natural, but there's really not anything natural about it. We've created a system where it's stressed and any perturbation causes a fish kill. Uh, we have about 21% of those fish kills are unknown, so perhaps something's getting in the stream that we didn't see causing fish kill. Animal waste is about 27% and then other things happening. So again, we've got these situations with fish kills happening, we've got the algae blooms, we have waters that are, that are impaired for uses, whether it's drinking water, aquatic life, or swimming. And you can see that the state of Iowa has a number of these impairments. And I won't go into all the different impairments, but when you look at that map, one thing you should know is that we only have about 60 monitoring stations in the state of Iowa. So this map is limited by monitoring as much as anything. We simply don't have data in many of these areas, which is why we don't have more impairments. And when you look at the sources of impairment for Iowa, algae is one of the leading impairments for lakes. Bacteria, fish kills, and biological impairments are the leading causes for streams. So when I say biological impairment, it means we don't have the fish there that we should, we don't have the bugs in the stream that we should. And so again, you can see that all those hydrologic modifications and land use things that I talked about show up in the issues that we have with our water bodies. So the last thing I'll bring home for you in terms of water quality, because it is such a big topic, one of the things we've done in the state is create what I call the water quality index. And this takes nine different measures and puts them on a score, which most people can relate to, which is, are you excellent? Are you good? Are you fair? Are you poor or very poor? And this looks at about 15 years of data for the state of Iowa. And you don't have to be an expert in milligrams per liter of nitrate or fish kills or anything to look at that map and say, there's very few, I don't see a single point up here that's excellent. We have a few that are in the good, and we've got a good here and a good there. This one, there's a reservoir above that site, so it's holding back all the sediment and nitrogen and stuff. Um, this one's just kind of an anomaly. But when you look at our map, we're mostly in the fair to uh, poor category, which tells us that we don't have the water quality that we want for the state of Iowa. All right, so what are we doing to fix it? Well, we got two approaches, regulation and voluntary approaches right now. And I put this out there. Um, I know this is being recorded, but I had to do a deposition for Des Moines Waterworks. And I've given, this pre I've given pieces of this presentation before, and they showed me this slide and said, well, what do you mean by this? What did you mean by showing that slide? Well, I think it's pretty 
pretty obvious what it meant. Um, that if we keep doing the same thing and we expect a different result, we're probably not going to get that different result. And here's an example. Um, this is from an environmental working group document from 2011. And this is looking at using Iowa State data, so we can't dispute it because it comes from Iowa State, right? So it's <laughs> Iowa State data using the mesonet, which is that rainfall thing that I showed you before, comparing that with what kind of cover we have on the landscape and, and um, a very simple model of erosion. And using that uh, um, calculator that Iowa State put together, Environmental Working Group came up with an average soil erosion. And I know I can barely read these, so you can not read them at all, I know. But where this blue arrow is, this is five tons per acre which we always call T, which is tolerable soil loss. So the agronomist will tell you that T is probably not truly tolerable, it should be less, but let's go with it for a second and say five is tolerable. So anything that's green is tolerable soil loss. And by the time we get up here, purple is greater than 100. So if five is tolerable, 100 is probably not very tolerable. And this is after 100 years of soil conservation on the landscape. And I would say, <laughs> I would uh, hypothesize that we are not seeing the erosion improvement that we need to be seeing after 100 years of conservation, right? We're getting still tremendous amounts of erosion over here. And here was, this is where we saw the grassland, right, that I showed you before. Um, again, this is 2011, so some of this grassland's been lost in the ethanol boom that we had about that time. And that's where it's flat. So we shouldn't have as much erosion anyway. So, okay, soil loss in some ways is kind of our crown jewel for the state. We've done probably better on soil erosion than anything, but we're still not doing a great job on it. <laughs> Nitrate. So one of the big um, debates <laughs> that we have in the state is whether nitrate levels are going down. And the North Raccoon data has been sort of the epicenter of whether raccoon uh, levels of nitrate are going down. And a number of people have kind of shown graphs that look at this, and they say, oh look, it's going down. <laughs> and I say, well that's the elephant's tail, we kind of need to <laughs> stretch that elephant out. That in fact, the three highest values we've ever seen on the Raccoon River since monitoring, since 1986, have happened in the last three years. So uh, I don't know that I would say that this is a downward trend, and most importantly, we're seeing these higher highs. So that's a problem. We're not getting the nitrate uh, reduction that we say we're getting. Um, and we have, you know, we have a little bit of a drought here, which nitrate doesn't move in a drought because nitrate has to have water to dissolve it and move it off. So we had this drought low, and then we had a big boom coming out of uh, 2013 with a big flood. But even since that flood, and people will talk about the flood being a problem in 2013, 14 and 15 have been very high as well, and 16 is shaping up as a very high year too. So you can't blame it on drought then flood anymore because we're like three years out from that. So this is a challenge. And if I go back to data that we have at the beginning of the century, our average levels are more like one and a half to two. So we're nowhere near background, and beginning of the century wasn't really background anyway. We had lots of farming. All right, so what do we do? I'm obviously not the monkey on the right. <laughs> um, so what do, we, what do I think we can do? What do I recommend that you do? Well, I mean, I have to bring up that I think it's about stewardship for all of Iowans because you guys are here. And you're obviously <coughs> interested and passionate. I think one way to get involved, and again, I'm biased, and I'm the Iowater coordinator, so I'm going to say Iowater, and I'll talk about Iowater in a second. I think grassroots coalitions, I think public-private partnerships are important. I think there's a lot of things that can be done. So, if you're interested, uh, iWater is a program where we train citizens to do basic water quality testing. Uh, we give you, I've got these really fun nitrate test strips, and you can test nitrate all the live long day if you want to. Um, there's a database where you can submit your data. I've got a workshop coming up in late April in Scott County, but if there's enough people locally interested, um, I can get people here trained in doing water quality. And we do all the things that I've talked about. And there are field kits, they're household waste friendly, you can take them home, test your backyard, throw, throw the stuff away in your garbage, report the data, 
use the data locally and do all kinds of fun things with it. So I think Iowa Water is a great way to get people knowledgeable about water quality. Knowledgeable citizens who have done Iowa Water go to their legislators and talk from a point of knowledge. And that impresses and I think informs our decision makers in a way that um, oftentimes they don't get approached it. And I think that this is really an important piece that <coughs> citizens have credibility with decision makers. Um, David Osterberg and I had a coffee on Friday, and sorry David if you're hearing this and I'm speaking out of school, but um, I've often heard just one or two phone calls makes a difference. And I said to him, I've heard like eight, he goes, three. Three phone calls on the same subject make a huge difference to the legislator. That they've heard enough that they need to take action. And so I think that if you call and say, I've been doing eye water testing, this is what I know, this is what we're seeing, we want you to get involved, you know, we want you to do X, Y, and Z, it makes a difference. Case in point, um, last year, Rivers Revival, full disclosure, I'm a board member of Rivers Revival, wanted to get a turtle hunting protection bill, and it was a non-starter. No one wanted to talk about protecting turtles, nobody cared, blah, 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 we just don't care. And in basically one year, getting enough people on social media to talk about turtles don't have protection, they've been harvested tenfold more than they were, you know, those few people nipping at the heels of the right legislators got a bill passed out of the House. And it was, it was phenomenal. And those of us who were like, oh, this is dead on arrival, those few voices that got more voices got something accomplished. And so it does make a difference if you can go and say, no, 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 we're the only state without turtle protection. You know, so getting involved, getting that knowledge, and, and getting active, I think, does make a difference. As well as, oftentimes, we need to do things locally. So we can kind of pick at Mike about things that we're going to do locally to improve <laughs> Johnson County water quality. What can we do locally? A lot of states, are, or a lot of counties and municipalities are talking about the four-inch topsoil rule. We need to protect the top four inches, put that back on the landscape after we do a development. It is such a no-brainer. It is such a no-brainer to put that topsoil back on. It's good for the people that are buying the house. It's good for the environment. It's good for everybody except for the people who don't want it to happen. But it makes, it makes tremendous sense. And if you've ever done monitoring, if you've ever walked around Iowa City after a rainstorm and you see the curbs weeping, that's because the clay underneath that sod has nowhere, that water can't go down that clay. If there was four inches of the topsoil, we'd get some infiltration, we'd get some processing instead of it just kind of seeping out into the, the, store, uh, the street. So things like four inch topsoil rules make a difference. And it also makes a difference that when Iowa City does something and then we turn to our farmer friends and say, we'd like you to do something, everybody's working on your shoes together. Everybody's putting skin in the game. As an example, um, <laughs> I've used this picture, this set of pictures uh, a million times, but this is, this is in Wright County. Um, a volunteer came to me. This is what we call sewage algae. It grows in raw sewage. This is Buttermilk Creek. This is where all the kids went to play. <laughs> These are bloodworms. They're a midfly larva, about as big as your hair, about yay long. They have hemoglobin because they can live in basically low oxygen environments. This is where all the kids played. This is where we had about four or five homes directly discharging septic waste into the stream. Um, it's a violation of Clean Water Act and we could have fined people and you know we could have spent 20 years trying to fix this in litigation and stuff. But what happened is the volunteers went to the community, they figured out money to fix this and it was addressed in about four years uh, from start to finish, from identification to no problem. Which in my world, four years is lightning fast working together locally to do monitoring, address problems, talk about problems, fix problems, check, move on. All right, um, one other thing I think is really important is people like to talk about economics. And I think telling people why water quality, good water quality is important to economics is a really important thing. We don't do that enough. So this is a survey that was done by Iowa State to look at preferences of people that go um, to recreate at Iowa Streams. And I'm sorry, this is, again, teeny, teeny um, writing. But the number one thing that people do at Iowa Rivers is 
relaxing. They just want, people want to be around water, but they don't want to be around water that's green and smells bad and has dead things floating on it. So, um, but people love to go to Iowa. And I'm so short, sorry, but <laughs> what was really eye-opening is that things that catch the eyes of decision makers and people who invest in the state of Iowa, I'm gonna read this, is that usage varied notably by demographic groups. Heaviest usage was reported by younger, more educated, higher income individuals. So if I'm a company wanting to move to Iowa, don't I want younger, high educated people with money? You know, these are the kinds of people that you want to keep in the state of Iowa. They want to be near high quality water. So we need to have high quality water to keep the workers that we want here, to keep the, you know, keep the state really, I think, cooking along in terms of being a viable state. But they don't want abundant algae, they don't want sediment, and they don't want bacteria. And positive factors influencing choice of where they recreate is water quality safe for human contact, natural setting dominating the riverbanks, so probably not a lot of concrete, probably not little blades of grass along the stream, and abundant game fish. And so again, when we start to look at what people prefer to see, um, it becomes obvious that we need to restore our rivers. Um, what do we know about water quality and economics? Well, this is from, again, this is old data, I apologize. But in 2008, we had these really fun nitrate sensors on the Raccoon River, monitoring nitrate concentrations every 15 minutes. At the same time, we also have something measuring how much stream flow is coming by. If we put the two together, we can figure out how many pounds of nitrogen were going by that sensor. And pounds of nitrogen have an economic value, right? The farmer applied that, he's losing it down the stream. And what you can see at Jefferson in, from March 27th through uh, or, uh, November 16 is about, eh, let's see, $9 million of nitrogen went by that sensor. There's a lot of one stream for a couple, you know, a couple months there. So when we start to show these graphs to producers about the amount of nitrogen going by the stream and the value to them, we start to get a different conversation going in the state. But those are real dollars leaving the state of Iowa. That's just the loss in economic, you know, if you were to apply that nitrogen, it has nothing to do with all the other um, economic consequences of that nitrogen. All right, so what's the vision? Where can you guys run with this? <clears throat> well, my new vision of Iowa is a lot of it's restoring the ecological function, reconnecting our floodplain, giving our floodplains room to move, putting natural vegetation back on there, giving them wetlands, giving things time to really absorb the nutrients, absorb the water, reducing flood. And it sounds obvious, but man, we're still crud crowding the floodplains like crazy. And we're not putting very natural things down there. We need to restore soil health. So this is where I say, this is why Iowa City should pass a four inch topsoil rural Porterville at North Liberty. Because if the urban folks do it, then we can also say, well, we need to have that happen on the, ur or the rural side as well. And part of that are things like perennial crops and, and having crops that we don't have to plant every year. But the big thing is mimicking that natural cycle. How do we mimic that prairie function that we used to have? How do we get back that groundwater dominated hydrology? Get back to slow hydrology, get away from fast hydrology. Um, for example, <laughs> this is one of my favorite, favorite things from practical farmers, is put cover crops on, right? And we're up about 1% of Iowa cropland has a cover crop net right now. So a cover crop is planted late in the season. It comes up when it's warm in, in October, November, December. Uh, it protects that soil. So if we get a big rainstorm like we did in, in December, when that rain comes down, it acts like the prairie. It's holding that water back. It's locking nutrients into the soil. It's providing better soil quality. And this year, where we've had a really warm winter, it's especially important. And I drove back from Des Moines today, and you can see the fields that have cover crops, they're green, and they're growing like crazy, and if it rains three inches, they're much more protected. Everything else is going to erode like crazy with a big rainstorm. And we're not gonna get planting in this state for another couple, like another month at least. So this would be huge. If we had 100% participation in cover crop, that would change the dynamic in the state greatly. We get 
50% reduction in nitrate under cover crop. Our goal for the, the hypoxic zone for um, Gulf of Mexico is 50%. It's actually 45. We could pretty much deal with many, many, many of our problems by just having cover crops. Less flooding, less soil erosion, nitrogen control. Um, it provides potentially food for livestock. It provides habitat for wildlife. It is an incredible thing. We just don't have the political will to do it. We really, we just really don't. Other thing is stream restoration. The state of Iowa is starting to invest in stream restoration, and uh, we've been, Rivers Revival has been really pushing hard to get appropriations for, for river restoration. Because right now we have this situation, we don't have any processing of nutrients. If the water is trying to go from the landscape to the stream, it just kind of goes right through with no processing. This is, a, this is an immediately after picture, but basically what happened, this is up in um, an urban environment on the campus of Northern Iowa, you take that slope back, a much more gentle slope, you reinforce the toe a little bit, you plant prairie plants here, and let it go crazy. It, it processes nutrients, it locks that soil in place, it gives fish place to hang out. This got hit, this was planted I think in 2006, um, or 2007, 2008 was a flood year, right? This thing held beautifully, it did not move. If you reconstruct it right, it's going to work. And so we've seen that we've got a number of examples where that river restoration is happening. But again, um, we're very slow to appropriate monies and technology to get there for the state of Iowa. This is a tremendous thing that we could do for our streams and our water quality overall. And I just leave, I love this picture. Um, one of my good friends, Mike Delaney, who's, uh, Mike's right here, he calls it geezer power. And I always show this to my, my young um, college students that these guys pulled a snowmobile out of mud. <laughs> um, you know, and, and while it didn't change water quality <clears throat> tremendously, the fact that they did it, garbage gets more garbage. I think the more waters are green and muddy, people sort of give up caring. And so doing things like having cleanups, doing things that improve water quality to get to better water quality. And taking a snowmobile out of the mud is tremendously backbreaking work, and yet these guys did it, and they're really proud. So there's a number of ways you can get involved. I'm going to open it up for questions to talk about any of the hand-waving crazy ideas I've thrown out there or get ideas from you guys. Um, so I think we'll turn on the lights and have a conversation. soil and you can blow compost in on your soil and get that that better soil um, health going as well as retaining doing whatever you can to retain water um, I believe in Iowa City there is a grant program that you can apply for to do pervious pavers on your driveway I love pervious pavers I think they're beautiful and we're doing a monitoring project right now John Lundell the mayor of Coralville uh, I don't remember his name we have a, a patio where they did pavers on the patio we do not see a drop of water coming out of those paver systems, not a drop. And we actually thought that John Lindell's property in Coralville, it was a little undersized. And there was a, there's usually a drain, but in case it does fill with water, it would drain. They, they infiltrate water. And so putting in those pervious systems where the water hits the pavement, goes into the rock chamber below, so usually you've got the rock chips between, they work phenomenally well. So, you know, paver systems, um, alleys with pavers. Dubuque is building hundreds of alleys with paver systems. You don't have to apply salt. You don't have to plow them because the ge geothermal effect um, melts the snow and infiltrates that. There's all kinds of things that, that folks can do. And 
basically, I think retaining the water on your property is a big, big advantage for, for Iowa's water quality. And I, I agree, and I think it's important with any research to look at who funded it, you know, what kind of other, how does it fit in the context of all the other data that's out there? Because, you know, sometimes you get, you pick that one study that, well, that doesn't seem to add up with all these other studies that are out there, so I think that's important. I'd like to know more about your four-inch topsoil replacement, because I think this area, Iowa City, Coralville, and North Liberty, there is unrestrained and perhaps um, less control than we might like building going on. So, and, and I'm part of a group that is looking at some of the legal structures and the fact that our current legal structure is really not serving the needs of the people and trying to find another way. And I think this might be a really good subject for us to explore in terms of creating some ordinances for these cities to pass. Yeah. So and how can I get more information about um, well, I can give the grantees information, so if you guys are a conduit for information, I can use that. There was a state rule that sort of got put aside, a lot of politics, as you imagine, on that. And so communities are now going in and passing those their or own ordinances. Um, and it really goes back to that notion that when you do a development, if you strip away all the original topsoil, then what happens is you've got that compact, compacted clay beneath. And that four inches is kind of a minimum. Um, some people say you should put back on the original. And we find that four inches does give us enough of a, a buffer that you can actually get good plant growth and the soil will continue to develop after that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some model ordinances that are happening. I think Cedar Rapids is in the process of passing one or working on one. Um, I think Coral is kind of a talking about it. And really we need these municipalities to, to work together on sharing those model ordinances because I think um, to me, again, it's kind of that no-brainer thing that we could do, that if we've got healthy soil, again, it's a win for the people buying the house, because if you come in and buy a house and it's, you've got sod on clay, the first thing that happens is the sod dies. And then you have to hire a landscaper to you know, beautify your land and your property, and so the cost gets passed to the homeowner regardless. Um, so some of the arguments have been, well, that's just, it just adds to the cost of the house. And my personal opinion is that's the time to do it because you can spread it out for a longer period of time. And they're gonna have to deal with it one way or the other, um, either as a, you know, bringing in some landscaper to do it or do it right away. Um, Minnesota has actually gone the path of having more planned development of incorporating features like wetlands and trees and trying to do as little soil construction as possible. And I think that's another thing to be talking about is instead of kind of flatten your, the planning development, how you contour the development and leaving more of those natural areas where possible. To not flatten it and build on that former wetland and then build a pond over here because you've got to do that for stormwater. It's like, well, let's leave the, leave the wetland or leave that low spot. Um, so Minnesota's got some pretty interesting kind of things that they're doing as well, Part, parts of Minnesota are. So, uh, but I can share some of those model ordinances or things that are happening with the grannies to, to share with you all. To plant, um, replant wetlands, like even here locally, like right on the, on the banks of the Iowa River? Yeah, I mean, I think that those riparian, those near river wetlands were incredibly important. Um, and so having that function really serves as a way of filtering those nutrients, filtering the sediment, um, oftentimes providing habitat for things that, that need that. Um, and so I would love to see more of that happen where possible. Um, you know, I think one of the conversations, and to be perfectly honest, I haven't followed the Gateway Project as closely as, as I would want to, but, you know, so we're doing some wetland filling with uh, Gateway with Dubuque Street. So what, where's the offset on that gonna be? What are we doing with that, that wetland mitigation that has to happen with the filling? Um, I don't actually know where we are with that, and I think that that's a conversation the community needs to have about, so are we, are we putting other wetlands in along the river to compensate for the ones that are being lost? Um, I'm sure they are, there's something happening, you have to, um, but are we putting them in the best places to get the best ecological function? Those are conversations that we should have. Um, you know, and it's I'm not discounting the flood issues and protecting people from floods, but those, those wetlands along the river provide a tremendous function for everybody, both us here locally, folks downstream, better health, Ecological systems, so that's that's an important piece, absolutely. Yeah, I have a question. Rather loaded, and you choose not to answer. It's fine. But what's going to happen? 
happen when we have a pipeline that transfers that transects the state from the northwest corner to the southeast corner and cuts through all these piles. I mean, the farmers are just frantic about it. Um, some of them are still holding out, but others seem to have just sort of given up and said there's nothing we can do about it. But it seems impossible that that is not going to have some impact. Um, yeah. So two thoughts. One is, yeah, I mean, so pipelines are not infallible. Um, tiles are tiles are directly, um, you know, they 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 pick up stuff and carry it to the stream. So that that's a challenge. One thing I would recommend is there is a group, and again, I don't recall their names off the top of my head. There's a group. We're actually giving them a volunteer monitoring award in a month in Tampa, Florida. Um, they've been doing a lot of pipeline monitoring and, and stuff out east, and they have protocols for monitoring that and looking at impacts on waterways. So again, that's something I can get to the grannies if you guys want to see those protocols or even have the woman you know, come speak or, or whatever. So there is there's stuff that's been kind of a model or a way to talk about that out east that I think could be brought to Iowa. You know, just, I mean, I'm sort of like, okay, well, if you're going to do it, then there ought to be protocols to make sure it's not having an impact. Know, everything should be monitored and verified, right? Um, that just seems common sense. And they're doing it with volunteers with some you know, low cost, um, low technology kinds of things. We don't have to spend a ton of money to do that, um, to keep track of that. So I would encourage folks that are interested to look at that model and see how it could be applied. Yeah, it would be interesting to have that information as well. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't think anybody else is going to monitor it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and part of the problem is that oftentimes, and we see this with fish kills, you know, they always happen in isolated areas where there aren't people monitoring the impact until it becomes a big impact. And right. so no matter what happens, we don't want little impacts to become big impacts or a little spill to become monumental. And then we're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. We want to address things, um, you know, quickly. And so I think having some sort of systematic way of looking at that, um, there are things that can be done in a really low cost way um, just to make sure that we're not having We like to give our speakers a little token gift. Oh, and, yay! Um, <laughs> we make these bags. Oh, those are cool. Um, reusable bags to hopefully help you not use a plastic bag. And this kind of ties into water quality because about 61% of all the plastic we use ends up in the oceans, mm -hmm. even here, oh. because it goes. Yeah. Microplastics are really big issue, which I didn't even address, but. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, use a reusable bag, and 